Time to get started this evening. I want to welcome everyone for midweek uh, Bible study. Have some prayer requests. Richard Notgrass is scheduled for skin cancer surgery on Tuesday, October the 31st. And the Roque family will be traveling to Honduras on Friday for a mission trip. Please pray for their safety and success in reaching souls for the large church. Also, please remember all of our shut-ins and those that are on our prayer list. Youth Devo will be at the home of Ron and Brenda Estes on Saturday, October the 14th at 6 p.m. Elders, deacons, and preachers meeting will be on Sunday, October the 22nd after the morning service. The wives are invited to the Estes home for lunch. Ladies' Day at the Dexter Church of Christ, the theme is A Feast for the Soul, is on Saturday, November the 4th, registration required by Sunday, October the 22nd. Uh, see the bulletin board for the Ladies' Day and other upcoming events. That's all the announcements this evening. Song leader tonight will be Andy Bassford, lead us in 634. Closing prayer tonight will be with, by Scott Shipley. Uh, we're still in the book of Luke. We uh, had gotten into chapter 5 last week. We'll review a little bit at, at the end of chapter 4, kind of catch everybody up on where we're at. Before we do that, let's go ahead and, and go to uh, our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful to you for this day that you have blessed us with. We're thankful, Father, for all things of life that you have given us. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity that we have tonight to come together here and study your word. Thankful, Father, for uh, Christ who died for each of us, and we're thankful, Father, for uh, the lesson that we, we have been able to study about his life here on earth. We pray, Father, that uh, you would continue to help those that are not well at this time. Pray, Father, if it be your will, that they may be better and be back with us again. We pray, Father, for Brother Richard in this upcoming uh, surgery that he's having. Pray, Father, that all things may go well with him. Also, we want to pray for the Roquet family as they're going on a mission trip this coming week. Pray, Father, that uh, they may be safe while they're gone, that the things that they will be presenting will uh, bring much souls to uh, that area and also strengthen the members there. Pray, Father, that we may continue to look to you for guidance that we need in our lives in all things. We pray, Father, that you would continue to forgive us and pray all these things to your Son and our Savior, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I, uh, on Sunday, I was at the Hermitage Congregation, uh, Hickory County Church of Christ in Hermitage, Missouri, and I, I didn't know exactly what I'd walk into because uh, Kent Akins had been there for several years. We'd helped support the congregation there and we still do uh, he did a very good work while he was there and uh, I was pleased with what I seen because the base of the congregation is still good and and they don't have a full-time minister there anymore uh, Kent was getting not only help from us but he was also getting help from a particular individual and also from some other congregations and they don't have that support now. So what they've done is they've used one of the preachers from the uh, Bible Institute of Missouri in Springfield, the preaching school there, a man by the name of 
of Colin uh, Simply, I believe is his last name, and uh, him and his wife and, and their two children, he comes there on Sunday and preaches for them and tries to uh, keep things going, and he seems to be doing a good job of, of that. But the congregation I was, I was pleased with, uh, they seemed to still be uh, interested in what was going on at the church there. Uh, they used to have 15 to 20 when Kent was there. They're down to about 12 to 15 now, so it's changed a little bit. But when you had that number, even if you have one or two families that drop out, you could tell the attendance right away. So continue to pray for them uh, in that congregation as, as they do need prayers. All right, so we are in Luke chapter, we had started in Luke chapter 4 last week and went into the first part of chapter 5, and we had talked about the temptations that Christ went through with Satan in the 40 days that he was in the wilderness, and especially the three temptations uh, that he went through at the end of that uh, wilderness uh, journey, and today when I got into my truck to run some errands, there was, uh, I, I had the radio station on here, 106.9, if you ever get the opportunity to listen to it, I know it doesn't go out very far, but they always have some very good lessons, and uh, the particular brother was preaching on those three temptations, so I thought, I'll listen to this for a little while and see if there's something that I, I left out. And, and most of the, everything that he said that I covered, but he did say one thing that I thought is very simple, but what was said I thought was very good. He basically stated that these three temptations that Jesus went through and the other temptations that he went through, that he was prepared. He was ready for, the, for Satan to tempt him. And he was using that as an example for us to be ready because we are going to be tempted. And we talked a little bit about that, but I thought he did a very good job of going, getting to the point. So uh, again, his point was, we're gonna be tempted, so we need to understand that, so let's be ready for that temptation. So Jesus went through this temptation, and after the temptations, he went to the area of Galilee, and also to the uh, town of Nazareth, and while he was there, he would go into the synagogue and he would uh, teach there according to Luke uh, 4 and verse 15. Now, Nazareth was, of course, where Jesus was from, where he grew up, where he, everybody in the town there, depending on how large that town was at the time, uh, they would have known who Jesus was. And it does tell us in, I believe it's verse 22 of chapter 4, that they knew that he was the son of Jesse, or excuse me, not Jesse, but Joseph. He was the son of Joseph. Uh, while in the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus has the opportunity to read from Isaiah, and he reads Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, which is found here in uh, verses 18 and 19 of chapter 4. Now, Jesus was reading, as he read that, of course, he was talking about himself. And the people, after listening to his reading, they were skeptical because they knew, again, who he was. They knew who his family was. And through this reading, he's referring to himself. And from the reading that we get there, sounds like maybe they were picking up on that, but they were very skeptical of what he was saying. And as he keeps talking, he, he in uh, verse 21, he states, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he tells them that this is who he's referring to there in verse 21. And again, they were skeptical, but they didn't get mad yet. And so even though he was referring to himself as the person here that's being talked about, the Messiah here in uh, Isaiah, uh, they didn't get mad about that. But he starts talking about, in these next three or four or five verses, about Elijah and Elisha. 
and he says that when Elijah and Elisha went into a particular areas, that they helped the Gentiles, but they basically did not help the Jews. And in verse 28 and 29, when he tells them this, now these Jewish people here in the synagogue, they got angry. And they took Jesus outside of the synagogue. They took him outside of the city of Nazareth. And they were going to throw him off the cliff. In other words, they were going to kill him. Now, what was interesting is what's stated in verse 30. It says, then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. So, miraculously, he just disappeared amongst them. He just passed through them. And then Jesus goes on. So he's telling the people here in uh, Nazareth that uh, the Gentiles, basically what he's telling them is the Gentiles are also going to have that opportunity of salvation. And he gives that information through Elijah and Elisha, what they had done about not helping those Jews. And that's what they were getting mad about. And when he leaves, he goes on to Capernaum, and again, he goes into the synagogues to teach. The Jews in Capernaum, it states in verse 32, they were astonished or amazed. What were they astonished or amazed about? Verse 32, well, he taught with, in the New King James Version, authority is the word that's given. In the King James Version, It's power. So Jesus taught with authority and with power. And we talked about scripture last week where he got that authority and power from God himself. But while in Capernaum, there was a a man in the synagogue that had a demon according to verse 33. And then in verse 35, it tells us that Jesus rebukes the demon and he told it to come out of the man and the demon obeyed and he came out. Now, when that happened, what was the people's reaction? Again, it's the same thing. They were, they were amazed. Again, they were amazed, as it tells us in verse 36. And again, they were seeing the absolute and the complete uh, power and authority that Jesus had over nature, now over these demons, they, Jesus had this power over all things. And because of it, and what people were seeing, now the people were starting to talk about Jesus even more. In verses 38 and 39 there in chapter 4, uh, Jesus is at Simon Peter's house. And, of course, Simon Peter is the apostle that is chosen by Jesus But while he's there, Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. Jesus heals her, and immediately she arose and served them, according to verse 39. And again, we talked about uh, how the Catholic Church, again, stated Peter was the first pope, but their qualifications were that uh, the popes were not married, and we see here that Peter was, so they must not have read that part of the Bible to have made him the first pope. All right, and then verse 40 and 41. I could not remember if we had covered this or not. So let me, let me go ahead and read that and make a couple comments here. Verse 40 and 41 of chapter 4. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now, what were the demons stating about Jesus? Yeah, they were stating the truth. You are the Christ, the Son of God. It was the truth. All right? And Jesus rebuked them for saying that, correct? So he rebuked them for saying that. Now, why would he not allow these demons to speak that? He did not want to be speaking. Yeah. Here we go. 
Sean's got the microphone. Jesus did not want to be recognized in, by uh, the demons to give Satan a, uh, an end right. toward uh, persecuting him. Uh, and oftentimes, in addition to this, we find that people, some people, when they have a strong uh, evil within their life, where Satan is controlling part of the life, are going to rebel against the preachers, our elders, our, our Christians, because they don't want to be recognized for the evil which they have. And we need to be very careful about that, that we not find ourselves caught up in that particular snare of the devil. Right. Ryan, right behind you. Jesus did not come to this world to be worshipped above all other things, although he rightfully should be. He came to teach us and lead us, and he came to be a servant and to serve mankind and show us the way to go. He didn't come to be praised and glorified as God Almighty is and, and as he should be and, and from heaven. He was trying to teach us how to be human beings and be righteous before God. Yeah, he was giving us an example of how we should act, and, and he, he had the perfect example, as we know. Richard, you got your hand up. Right here. I'm just going to say the same thing that Larry was talking about, but Jesus did not want the Satan to recognize him. He wanted to be the one that's teaching and teaching those to come into him and not have the other way around. On top of what they said, uh, the Jews at the time had a very physical mindset of the what would happen. The, the Messiah would be on the physical throne of King David's throne, throw off the shackles of the Roman government and rule over a physical kingdom, while we all know that Jesus he was not sent on earth to be a physical king on a physical throne. And that's one thing is on top of, you know, not wanting Satan saying he's Christ. He, do, he doesn't want those that aren't supposed to, whose uh, eyes have been closed and ears have been uh, closed to understand the truth of who he is because it's a very spiritual thing of the understanding of who Jesus is. Right. I think, I think you're on the right track there that Jesus did not need the demon support. He didn't want their support. If he, if he takes their support or doesn't rebuke them and tell them to be quiet and they continue on with this, maybe the people start thinking, well, maybe Jesus... You remember how the Pharisees and scribes were? They were always looking for something to attack Jesus with. And maybe they would say, well, Jesus is in collusion here with the demons or Satan. So there's, there's some reasons why Jesus did not want the uh, demons to be saying these things. And I think all those answers that you guys gave were good. Larry? Already, already saying that Jesus cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Right. Correct. We cannot link ourselves at any time with someone that is of the devil or, or supports the devil or practices evil. And we have, that's going to be a temptation for us sometimes to, to give in to someone of that caliber or to give in to someone who says, well, that's not so bad, or some element of uh, Satan or sin. Uh, we have people out there right now wanting to okay many types of sin, but we can't do that. We can't go along with that no matter what. 
even if, if they might be relatives or friends of ours, we cannot has, have them support us or uh, build us up and say, well, that's correct, but what about this? Yeah. I think, and, and again, I'm saying I think, so I don't know 100% here, but a principle that's given here, and we see that uh, over the years with those that want to give money to the church, but they're not in the church, those people that are wanting to give money, and there have been uh, churches that would not accept that because of where it was coming from, and I, I think that's a good thing because uh, it would have just been an issue with the way that people would have looked at the church. So we've seen that in the past with uh, some churches that would not accept money. I remember one man that was wanting to uh, give a lot of money to the Christian Academy here in St. Louis years ago. Man was a millionaire, but he wanted to be on the board of directors. Well, he wasn't a member of the church. And the Academy could have used the money, they, they could always use it, but they would not put him on the board, which was the right thing to do. And that's what we should think about when we have people that come in and uh, they do want to support, but where's that support coming from? All right, so Jesus would not permit these demons here to uh, be stating these things. He didn't want to show that they were supporting, or he was supporting them. Another thing that we see here is that these demons, they had faith, didn't they? They had faith that Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Christ. They understood who he was. And did that faith save them because of that? No, they weren't saved because of faith. So that should tell people something today that it's just not faith and, no, and saying that I believe in Jesus, I believe in God that saves us. It takes more than just faith to be saved, faith working with obedience that will bring about righteousness. Sean? Uh, I believe one of the Pauline letters has in there that uh, even the even the uh, demons know Jesus, believe in Jesus, and they shudder at the thought of it. So all these people who call themselves religious, who believe as long as you believe in God, believe in Jesus, you're okay, you know, by their logic, you know, it would mean the, that uh, the demons would be perfectly fine as well, and we know that's not happening. Yeah. All right. Uh, then the last three verses there in chapter 4 states, Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. So with the things that Jesus was doing, they wanted to see and they wanted to hear more of Jesus. They wanted him to stay, you know, in these particular cities that he was going to because they wanted to see uh, these things that, and to listen to the words that he was telling them. But he basically tells them, I just can't stay here. I have other works to do. And Luke mentions it in chapter 8 and verse 1 when Luke stated he went through, referring to Jesus, Jesus went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. All people at that time had to know that the kingdom is coming and Jesus must prepare them to be ready and to be a part of that kingdom, which, of course, is the church. It's in the church where salvation is found. Those that are saved are added to the Lord's church, which is the kingdom. So... He had a mission, and he had to fulfill that mission, and, and basically he was uh, bogged down with a lot of people that were following him because of, of the miracles that he was, he was doing with uh, healing people and also because of the words that he was, he was teaching, and, his, and he was teaching with power and authority, and they seen that, that he was different. Now, did they believe he was a Messiah? They must have. Most of those people must have to... Uh, but it doesn't tell us that. 
we, we would have had to been there, I guess, to see what the, uh, what the people were thinking. All right, so chapter 5, Luke 1 through 7, chapter 5. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Genezaret, which is just basically the Sea of Galilee, and, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. This is Simon Peter again. So he got into Simon Peter's boat and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. So that must have been a sight to see. But we see here that the multitudes, again, were pressing on Jesus so much that he decided to go out on this boat and to speak to them where they could not come up to him. He would be away from them. For the, but they were still eager to hear Jesus. Yes. Yes. We would. There's no doubt about that. And, and that's, that's what I, I had a question here. It's that today we, we should all be eager to hear God's word just like they, they did so that we can grow as any of us, uh, none of us have, have arrived. Baptism put us in a state of, of salvation, no doubt about it, but we had to stay there. We had to continue on. So, Ron. This lesson that Jesus is trying to teach is so very much applicable to us yet today. How should I know how to go except someone show me? And uh, Jesus said, I come not to do my will, but to do the will of my Father. Uh, all can be saved. Jesus came that none could, should be lost. Even Satan himself, if he repented of his sins, and turn back to God and worship God, God has the power to save even Satan. But we were torn constantly as people in the world today with challenges that we look at and see and allurements that entice us and we fail to uh, follow God's word and that's when we fall into sin and that's when we fall away from God. But God never fell away from us. He's always been there for us. He wants all of us to be saved. And that Jesus came to this world uh, to show us a better way to go and how to be saved. There's no doubt the world is pulling on us all the time. And that's what we see. It's, it's a decision. We either accept or we reject. And that's what we're here for as Christians also is we are to teach others so we give them the opportunity to either accept or reject. Hopefully they will accept, but we know that many are going to reject. Sean? If you think about it, how many of those individuals who were crowding around Jesus were giving up a day's wage, a day's work in order to hear him? You know, it wasn't as easy as driving down the street to see him because unless they were right there in the same town as he was they would have been walking for uh, a while to see him and you know even then they would have had to give up a day's work to hear him speak probably and yet you know how many people in today's day nine to five work uh day uh, world we live in where people's excuses I don't have enough time to read the Bible and yet you know they have enough time to watch 
the big game, they have enough time to uh, play sports or whatever it is that they do during the day, you know? Well, yeah, and just going, I mean, we're a nation of people that are constantly on the move, but are we on the move to go listen to God's word? And I think that's the point that a lot of y'all are bringing out here. And, and well, we understand here, I, I wouldn't hear Sunday when Brother Smith was talking, but he may have said something about this because it seems like everybody that comes and talks to us from a, another poor country where there's not, everybody doesn't have a car or some don't even have a bike, they talk about how far they have to walk just to get to church services or how, how far they have to uh, stay or how long they have to stay somewhere if, if, if they have something like a lectureship in those particular countries. And that, would we do that? Would we walk, you know, several hours to go listen to God's word? Would we drive, you know? So that, that's something that we have to answer ourselves. I think that's a weakness that we see in our country. Hands are popping up all over the place. I might as well go sit down. <laughs> all right, where do we want to start? Sean, Richard, and then Larry. Uh, it's funny that you talked about what he talked about on Sunday because I did mis medical mission trips with my dad uh, when I was in high school, and every night we'd have uh, kind of a little bit mini Devo uh, service, and they would walk from hours one way to get there, dressed up in what we would call our Sunday best, whatever their best was yeah. that they could afford, they were dressed up in it. And they they were so excited to go. And yet, you know, how many of us can't go out to come hear a spe like just one day's worth of right. special speakers? They were hungry for, the, for listening to God's word. Richard. You know, I'm from the country, and there weren't any many cars, but when it was a gospel meeting, the building was full, they were standing around the walls, and they were standing on the outside as far as they could hear. And they must have walked for quite a ways to get there. When was this, and when you That's were younger? boy. Yeah. Larry. Everything has been said reminds me of Marshall Keeble. Marshall Keeble baptized thousands of people or had them baptized by listening to his preaching. One of the things he mentioned one time, he was in his late 60s and he was at a, a, a meeting in Africa and the hills all around where they were, he was to speak, were crowded with people come to hear him speak because the people were hungry for the word of God. And he was a common, ordinary man, not a dynamic man, but he carried the word of God with a very powerful, powerful means right. and spoke in a language that the people could understand. We need to try to do that today, and we need to put prayer into our lessons and into our speech. One of the things about Marshall Keeble was he was a very prayerful man, a very dynamic man in his prayers. He firmly believed in what he said and what he preached and what he prayed. Thank you. In 1 Peter 2.22, it states, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And this is, just doesn't, I know a lot of times when that verse is given, a lot of preachers and even teachers would talk about that's talking about new, new converts, but it's not. It's talking about all of us. Because it just uses the term, at, just like newborn babes, we should desire God's word and God's instructions, and it tells us so that we may grow thereby. Are we seeking God's word to know it? And then once we know that part of it, are we obeying it? 
I'll never forget David talking about, David Campbell talking about, uh, he was on a lectureship with Garland Elkins and Robert Taylor, and the three of them were talking. And uh, David asked Brother Taylor, have you ever, have you got to the bottom of the well? Do you remember that, David? Have you got to the bottom of the well? And Brother Elkins spoke up and said, he's just dabbling on the top of it. Well, what that means, we understand what that means, is you, th you take two men like Garland Elkins and Robert Taylor that studied and knew God's word. And, and they were saying, no, they're just still at the top. There, there's no way that we're ever going to get to the bottom of the well of understanding everything in God's word. That's why we're here tonight. That's why we should be studying at all times when we have the opportunity. That's why we should be taking the opportunities that we have to listen to God's word because there's things that are said, I think all of us can say this, is, you know what, I, I either forgot that or that's something new that I haven't thought of before. So there, there's, there is uh, good for us to do the studying that we need to be studying at all times and we need to seek and we need to also, as we've been told, to go out and share that message with others that we do come in contact with. So as the message of Jesus, he was healing, he was, he was getting out, he was spreading among all the people that he was, he was keeping, they were keeping him busy to the point that according to verse 16 here in chapter 5, that he would often withdraw into the wilderness to pray. He was staying so busy and the people were coming up on him that he was having to go by himself just to pray. He needed to be by himself. Now that's a good example to all of us. We need to, of course, have a prayerful life as Larry already talked about. But when we're busy, we still have to, ha we still have to find the time to pray and at times we need to find a place to be by ourselves to do that praying so that we can focus on our prayer and this example that that Jesus used here of going out and getting by himself and getting away from the people is also a good example to us all right verses 17 through 21 now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst uh, before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, him, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So we see that the Pharisees and the, we might call them lawyers, that's what it was called in, in uh, chapter 4, but it sees uh, teachers of the law, they were watching Jesus heal these people. They were watching this, and it talks about this one man that was paralyzed, laying on a bed. They couldn't get him through the crowd, so they, these men took him through the, the roof and laid him down. And Jesus sees the faith of these men, and he tells this man, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now, in verse 21, what Jesus said upset the scribes and Pharisees, as we've seen there. Who is this who speaks blasphemies, thinking only God can forgive sins? And they are right. God is the only one that could forgive sins, but Jesus is God the Son. So he could forgive sins. So they didn't understand that. They understood that God was the only one that forgave, could forgive, but they didn't understand, again, that who Jesus was. Even, again, they are considered the experts. They're the uh, lawyers. 
these men that should have been the Bible experts at that time or the experts of the old law, and they did not, again, know that Jesus was the Messiah. In verse 22, it says, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, so Jesus knows what they're thinking, and it says, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? So he answers their thoughts. And then in verse 24 and 25, he proves his authority and power, again, over nature. And what he is saying is now being seen by these doubters there in verses 24 and 25. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now, when the man immediately rose and he left, and these people seeing that Jesus had the ability to heal, verse 26 gives us an interesting uh, statement here, or, or tells us what these people thought. Verse 26 states, and they were all amazed, and, it, and that's interesting because it says they were all amazed. It didn't say that some of them were amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear. Even these Pharisees, I would say, were also amazed, and these teachers of the law were also amazed. When it used the term all, I, I don't think that leaves those, those guys out there. So even though we know that the Pharisees and these teachers of the, law, of the old law in, uh, all through uh, Jesus' life were always rejecting him and always uh, trying to trip him up, we seen here from this verse is that these men believed at that time. All right, verses 27 through 32, we'll see if we can get through this and probably stop there, but we'll see. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them, and their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right, I think, first of all, who's Levi? It's Matthew. It's the Apostle Matthew. It's the one that wrote the book of Matthew. Same man. Um, and we kind of see this in, in when... Uh, Jesus had, had called uh, uh, Peter and, and Andrew and James and John and told them to follow him, and they followed him. And, and Levi would have, I would think, knew who he was for him to just follow, but he does follow him. But it tells us that Levi was a, a tax collector. Matthew was a tax collector. We understand that. And, and we understand also uh, through different lessons that tax collectors were looked down upon at that time. And there was a good reason why they were looked down upon. Number one is they were hired by the Roman government. They were Jews, but they were hired by the Roman government to collect taxes from the people, their own people. And not only did they collect those taxes, but we do know this, and we'll talk about it. I don't know if we'll talk about it tonight. But they collected more than they should have. And we've seen that in, in what was said in some of these scriptures. We'll talk a little bit about that next week with uh, some scriptures that we had already uh, read earlier about tax collectors that came to John the Baptist and repented, and they were baptized, and they asked John what they should do. And if you remember what John told them, basically just paraphrasing, not to charge more than they should. So it was well known at that time that these tax collectors did overcharged for their services. All right, we'll start up there next week. 
I appreciate again for your comments and also for your attention tonight. If there's, we always want to give the opportunity for any that uh, have need of prayer uh, and for some sin that you might have in your life or just prayers of, of uh, your health or your spouse's health or, or anybody like that. If you have need of prayer tonight, uh, we'd ask that you stand with us and sing as we have the song led by Andy. We'll sing number 634, The Great Physician, number 634. And as we've lost so many to another class, let's all sing out to encourage one another. Number 634. <clears throat> The great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to cheer, oh hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. His name dispels my guilt and fear, no other name but Jesus. Oh, how my soul delights to hear the charming name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. And when to that bright world above we rise to see our Jesus, we'll sing around the throne of love, his name, the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in seraph song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've had to come another, study another portion of thy word. Pray, Father, that we will take those words and apply it to our lives and be more like Jesus as an example. Father, pray that you be with the sick and restore them back to their health and be thy will. Forgive us of our many sins and bring us back to the next appointed time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 